Hey World History, welcome to U9L3 Art of the Renaissance. Uh, if you are new to me, I am Miss Corey, by the way. I do a lot of the videos. Isn't this a cool background? Get it like Art of the Renaissance and it's like a painting background. I thought I was really cool when I found out. Okay, uh, learning target. Students will be able to identify the major art pieces and artists of the Renaissance era. Uh, your job, you're going to watch this Ed Puzzle. Questions that I ask you in blue text or just questions I want you to answer on the Ed Puzzle directly. Um, make sure you're also following along with your study guide. Any important concepts that you need to write down in your study guide will be in red text. Um, and of course, if you have questions, uh, email me or come to office hours or email Ms. Hinkle. We're here to help you. All right, so first question. When you think of Renaissance art and artist, what do you think of? There might be a lot to think of because there's a lot of very iconic art pieces at this time. Uh, so one of the biggest things that you'll see with art is religion. A lot, a lot of religion is portrayed in art during the Renaissance, specifically Christianity. Uh, one of the major things that artists loved to like create would be like a baby or like a kind of like a toddler Jesus with his Mary mother. Uh, that was very popular to do. Uh, also, kind of like classical, like Greek stories. Uh, those were really popular to paint as well. Um, the girl with the pearl earrings, that one is a very famous one. Um, you might think of like Leonardo da Vinci. He had some famous drawings. You also might think of churches during this time period as well. Uh, so a lot of the really grand cathedrals, a cathedral is just a really large church that are really iconic in Europe, were mostly built during the Renaissance time period. And if you ever want to learn more about the Renaissance or see Renaissance art, like with your own eyes, actually the Minnesota, or Minneapolis Institute of Art, uh, that's this building here, is located in like Minneapolis, like the city of Minneapolis. Uh, if you go to the third floor and right here where it's kind of like this raspberry color, that is where they have Renaissance art. And there's always traveling exhibits and stuff that come through with Renaissance art, so. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, today's agenda. This is what we're going to learn about. We're going to learn about patrons, uh, perspective, specifically the Brunelleschi perspective, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, and his paintings of The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa, Raphael, Michelangelo, and his sculpture of David, and his painting of the Sistine Chapel, Donatello, who also made a David statue. We'll get to that. Don't worry. Um, Jean von Eyck, who is another famous art artist, Ghiberti and the birth of Venus. So let's start off with patron. What the heck is a patron? So a pa patron is simply just a rich person or a group of people showing off their wealth through art. So it's pretty much, they're saying, hey, I'm super wealthy. I'm gonna buy a bunch of art and like show that off to all my friends. It's literally what a patron is. Uh, so it's bragging rights because you're rich and you can own all this art. Uh, so in the Renaissance time, it was typically, um, art was typically made for religious purposes or for private homes. It was not like in museums to be displayed to the public. But when those rich people had parties and all their friends came over, they'd see the, all the cool art and the patrons would be able to brag about it. So today there are patrons that still exist um, that have both private and public art pieces. I just Googled and apparently there's this couple right here from Miami, Florida who are very strong patrons of the arts. I mean, I guess if they have the money, that's cool. All right, perspective. So if you ever took an art class, specifically like drawing or painting, you probably know what a perspective is, uh, but it's an art technique of creating a 3D-like image on a 2D medium. So 2D medium would include like canvas or paper. Um, so kind of like, Here's kind of an example of a Renaissance painting, right? So this is on just a flat piece of canvas, right? Uh, but it looks with the shadowing, with the different colors, with the kind of the different lights coming through, it looks 3D. Uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, who was alive from 1377 to 1446, he was the first dude on record to come up with the linear perspective. Uh, and this would become known as the Brunelleschi perspective. You'll also learn about Brunelleschi 
I believe in the Ed Puzzle videos about the Medici family that you'll do next week. Uh, he's a big role in those videos. Uh, so Bruno Lecce, <laughs> Bruno Lecce um, studied how objects, buildings, and landscapes changed and lines change shape depending on distance and angle from its position. I'll show you an example on the next page. Uh, he was also a very famous architect and engineer, and he founded the new engineering style of Renaissance architecture that you'll learn all about when you watch the Medici family videos. So this is what I'm talking about when I say the Bruno Lecce perspective is um, having one focal point, right? And building out the angles of the walls, of the people, of the distance um, from that one point of perspective. So like, here's an example from The Shining, right? Very famous, the kids riding on a trike, the creepy twins are at the end of the hallway. That's an, expen or an example of a one point perspective, right? Because that's the main point and everything else is built around it. Uh, here's another very famous example. I believe this was Raphael who painted this. Um, but what it is, it is where you can see here, the perspective is right between these two dudes right here. Um, and then everything else is built around it. Like all the shapes are focused um, and angled in all around it. Like the shape of the arches, the staircase, the people. It gives that 3D effect on a 2D medium. Sweet. You can tell I am not an artist. I don't know a lot about art. So we'll just leave it at that. So Leonardo da Vinci, he's probably the most famous artist during this time period. So he lived from 1452 to 1519. Uh, he was born in Venice, Italy, and he moved to Florence at 15 years old, where he then studied painting, sculpting, and mechanical designs. Uh, he would then move to Milan in 1482 and work under a duke as a painter and an engineer. So like a duke is a noble like kind of like a mid-tier noble. They're pretty, they're pretty important people. Um, and that is where he painted the Last Supper and also the version of the rocks, which is one of his other very famous paintings. Uh, so here's the Last Supper here. Let's take a moment, look at it. Now I want you to name two details you observe in this painting. Don't say, I don't know. That's not it's not what I'm looking for. Just two things that you've noticed about this painting, okay? All right. So I don't know what happened there. My screen just kind of went blank. Uh, but looking back at the Last Supper, so apparently my image of it couldn't load. Um, but what it was is in the middle of the painting is Jesus. And when we talked about back in the Rome unit about Christianity, so to remember that he's supposedly the prophet and the son of God, according to Christians. Um, and in that painting, he's surrounded by his 12 closest followers, which would be called his disciples. Uh, this is very important, like scene to depict as well, because it was the night that Jesus was arrested by the Romans and put in prison, which then later he would be crucified on the cross. Um, he was also betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas, uh, who turned Jesus over to the Roman police. Um, and it is called the Last Supper because it was the last time Jesus would eat his disciples. So again, is that religious aspect is so important to Renaissance art. All right, so why would the theme of the Last Sum Supper be significant to the people in the Renaissance? What do you think? Don't say I don't know. You gotta give me something. Right? Yeah, it was going back to that religion, right? This is one of the most like pivotal points in the biblical stories. Um, and also it just really showed like how much Christianity shaped Europe um, from its beginning all the way through the Renaissance and then even beyond that. All right, so Leonardo, back to him, while in Milan, he also did a lot of observation of nature and nature is engineering. He had many notebooks that included his sketches and ideas as an engineer and artist. These are actually the real notebooks. 
Um, I forgot what museum has them, but someone has them. Uh, they include paintings, architecture, machinery, and the structure of the human body, and also his ideas of how to take flight. Uh, so he actually developed plans for an airplane and a helicopter, which, you know, today, I mean, we see airplanes going through the sky all the time. Um, but just think of this. This dude was thinking this stuff 400 years before the Wright brothers took their famous flight. It's pretty impressive. So here's his sketches of an airplane, and this is what he was thinking for a helicopter. So you kind of see like the spiral. All right, so let's talk about the Mona Lisa. Why do you think the Mona Lisa is so famous today? There's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, it is considered Leonardo's finest work. It shows his mastery of realism. Uh, it was very delicately painted veil on the woman's head. So this is something that I kind of forget too. But if you look really, really closely, you can kind of see like a black outline right through like the top of her head. Yeah, there's actually a sheer veil that is painted over her face. Like, come on, that is crazy to paint. Um, and no one knows who the woman is. There's some suspicion of who she is, but no one really knows for sure. Uh, there's a lot of details in the background. Like you can see the mountains, the lakes, the rivers. Uh, here's some bridges, here's a road. Um, and also she has that very slight smile, but yet no eyebrows. Uh, the really crazy thing is, is it's not that big of a painting like you would think you know it's like this massive painting but it's only like 21 inches by 30 inches so what like probably about that big it's tiny and you can see it today at the Lord. oh that's weird i don't know why some of my pictures aren't loading whatever all right so next up we got Raphael. so he was born in 1483 in Urb you know, Italy. He studied as an apprentice painter, but soon he surpassed his teacher. That's when in 1504, he moved to Florence, Italy, which we know as the place where the Renaissance started. That's where he met other artists like Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci, and Fra Bartolomeo. Um, and together they exchanged ideas and copied each other's techniques. Uh, he is most known for painting Madonnas and what Madonnas are. No, I'm not talking about the musical artist. Um, in Renaissance term, Madonnas are Mary, the mother of Jesus. So they're sculptures or paintings of her. So here are some examples of his artwork of Madonnas. All right. So in 1508, he went to Rome, Italy. And the Pope commissioned him to paint the inside of the Vatican, uh, which is a huge deal because the Vatican is the capital of the Catholic Church. In Rome, he painted his most famous work, which would be the School of Athens, which we saw in a few slides previously, uh, which depicts Plato and Aristotle. All right, so thinking back to the ancient Greek unit, I know not everyone was with me during ancient Greece, but who were Plato and Aristotle? And don't Google it. I want to know if you remember. Yes, you're right. Plato and Aristotle, they were famous philosophers. Uh, so here's Plato. He's this old dude right here. Here's Aristotle. Um, and then all these other peoples represent like others during like ancient Greece. Um, but I could definitely not name you all of them. Oh, no, that slide didn't work. Oh, well, we'll just skip it. All right, next up, we have Michelangelo. So he was a painter, sculptor, and architect. He was born in 1475 near Florence, Italy. Um, at 13, he studied painting, and in 1498, uh, he moved to Rome, uh, where he was hired to make a pieta. And what a pieta is, is a statue of Mary holding her son, Jesus. Uh, it was one of the most famous pieces of work by him, and it's carved out of one single solid block of marble. And if you don't know how marble is mined, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, so here's a picture of a marble mine. Of course, this is modern, um, but you can just see the slabs of marble and like the tiny little machinery. All right, so here is Michelangelo's most famous pieta. So you can see here, here is, according to Christianity, here is Jesus's mother, Mary. She's holding Jesus right after he was killed. 
the most like amazing part of this so remember this is all marble i mean look at it it looks like you can almost see like the pores in her face just like the softness of like her cheeks i mean you can it almost looks like she has eyelashes i mean look you can even see just the fine line of the eyebrows um and then here he was also a master at doing cloth um so again this is all one chunk of marble look at the detail of how the cloth folds over her sash and then this too uh so here's kind of a close-up of jesus hands so like there was a nail in his hand so you can see the hole where the nail would be and i know this picture is a little bit blurry or i don't know why it's not loading correctly uh, but if you look too you can also see a little bit of these shiny streaks those are veins of his hand that michelangelo carved into the marble all right so he would then move back to florence in 1501 and that's where he carved his very famous David statue out of marble as well. It is detailed down to the veins. Uh, if you don't know who David was, it's in a biblical story. He is a biblical hero who killed the giant Goliath with a slingshot. Um, and his I, like sculpture of David is the I, like represents the ideal male form in Renaissance standards. Um, the other crazy thing about this is it's 17 feet tall. Like, I always thought, like, oh, maybe it's, like, I don't know, like, seven, eight feet tall. Like, bigger than the normal human. This thing is, like, massive. So here's kind of a picture. Here's someone cleaning it. So you can kind of get an idea of how big this statue is. Uh, again, detailed down in the veins. I mean, look at that. It's crazy. Look at even like the little foldies in like your knuckles. He even got that. And then you look here, here's his eyes. Again, look at, I mean, like how he carved out the eyes. I mean, they're like, looks like spheres. And then his eyebrows even have eyebrow hair. And then look at his, his head hair, like crazy. All right. So in 1505, he'd go back to Rome. Uh, that's where the Pope commissioned him to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, what a chapel is, is just like a smaller version of a church. Uh, he would spend five years plastering the ceiling, drying the plaster, and then painting it. Uh, so he would paint laying down 60 feet in the air on scaffolding. So here's a modern kind of rendition of what he would have looked like painting it. Uh, and he painted biblical scenes from the Christian God's creation of man to the life of Jesus. Um, so there's lots and lots of biblical stories on the Sistine Chapel. So here's a picture of the Sistine Chapel. So you can see every single square centimeter, millimeter of this place is painted by him. And then here's the ceiling as well. Here's probably one of his most famous ones where according to the Christian Bible, this is where like God touches man for the first time. Probably one of the most famous paintings. And you can see here on the on the wall, this is supposed to represent like according to the Bible, Jesus ascending into heaven. So you can see that. And all the people around him. It's kind of crazy to think that it only took him five years. I feel like it would have taken him more. And here's the outside of the Sistine Chapel, which I find kind of interesting because it's like I mean, it's like fine, but like it's not that elaborate compared to the inside. All right, let's talk about Donatello next. So he was from 1386 to 1466. He was one of the first Renaissance sculptors, as you can tell, because he was born in the 1300s. Uh, so he bo was born and worked in Florence. So again, he's in the heart of where the Renaissance would have started. That's where he learned sculpting while working on a cathedral and baptistry, which is part of the church. Um, yeah, so a baptistry is where Catholics get baptized or welcomed into the church. Um, and he was also hired by the rich Medici family uh, for a statue of David. And you're going to learn a lot about the Medici family. Uh, he, so David, again, was that biblical character who killed the giant Goliath with a slingshot. We've talked about a few slides before. This one is made out of bronze and he totally redefined what it meant to be masculine. So here is 
my next question for you. What are the differences between the two art styles of the two Davids? So we have the Michelangelo one here. We have the Donatello one here. Okay. What's the difference between these two? Yes, so like I said before, he redefined the masculinity of early Renaissance and ancient sta statues. Um, so he used more of a feminine form, uh, which included things like, like very little muscles to no muscles, uh, very curvy body, um, nudity to show weakness instead of strength. Uh, although David was the one who defeated a giant, you can see on the statue here, he's stepping on the giant's head. Uh, he also has a very long hair and no beard, and he has his hands in a very sassy way on his hips. Sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Okay, uh, so kind of just to show, this would be like classical ancient Greek art. So this is from like 460 BCE. Yin, beard, muscles, like showing off like a really like athletic pose uh, versus Donatello's David is not that. All right, uh, some famous but not as famous include John von Eyck. So he was born in 1390 to 1441, so pretty early on in the Renaissance. He was born in Belgium. If you don't know where Belgium is, it's right here. Uh, he was really known for painting on wood and painting his religious scenes and using very bright colors. No, it doesn't show. I don't get why some of mine don't, don't pop up. That's weird. Hold on. If I exit out, do they show up? Oh, that's so weird. Uh, here, let me Google a picture of him real quick. So here's the picture that I had on my slides. So you can see. It is. This is all painted on wood. I know it's a little blurry here, uh, but you can see it's very bright colors. Again, you have that perspective kind of playing in here. Um, and again, very religious scenes. One day I'll figure out why my images don't always look. All right, another person would be Ghiberti. So he was from 1378 to 1455. So again, very, very early Renaissance, if not almost pre-Renaissance. He was also born in Florence. Uh, and he was selected as an artist to create two metal bronze doors for a baptistry in Florence. So again, a baptistry is kind of a part of a church. Um, Bruno Lecce also wanted to create these doors, but he did not get selected. So the doors are called the Gates of Paradise. They are covered with gold leaf, as you can see here. It took him 29 years to make this, which is kind of crazy. Uh, Michelangelo called them um, that they are beautiful enough for the gates of paradise. Um, and it shows Old Testament stories all around them. Um, so you can kind of see here, here are some figures. That's him, by the way. Like in the door, he put a sculpture of himself, as artists do. Um, and this is also important to more modern-ish days that they were they had to be hid during World War II because Nazis wanted to steal them. So again, here are the doors. Pretty cool. More of a close-up. Details, I mean, again, the folding of the cloth. You got that perspective point again because you can see the depth in the hallway, the depth of the people. I don't get it. All right. So next up, we have the birth of Venus. Uh, so this was a painting completed in 1485. And his artist is Sandro Botticelli. Um, and he was commissioned by a rich, the rich Florence family, the Medicis, which again, you're going to learn a lot about. Uh, it shows the birth of Venus. Venus was the Roman goddess of beauty. So not everything was around Christianity. They did also do like Greek stuff and Roman stuff. Uh, so according to legend, she was born from sea foam. So you can kind of see here, she's standing on a seashell. Um, and it shows the desire to have art depicting the glory of the Roman Empire and the Greeks. So again, here's kind of a close-up picture. See, she's standing on a seashell. 
pretty cool. All right, wrap up. Today we talked about patron perspective, the Bruno Lechewski perspective, Leonardo da Vinci with the Mona or with the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa, Raphael, Michelangelo with David and the Sistine Chapel, Donatello with David, Jean van Eyck, Ghiberti, and the birth of Venus. So next up, you're going to watch U9L4 at Puzzle on the Lutheran Reformation. Uh, if you have questions, comments, or want to learn more, um, email us or stop by office hours or something. We'll be happy to help you. All right, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Bye.